television highlights of the news of yesteryear. With Henry Ford assisting, Thomas Edison demonstrates use of his 1888 invention, the movie camera. F.P. Ott was actor in first Edison film made far from fields of place called Hollywood. Yes, this is Hollywood of long ago. Sleepy suburb of simple homes and modest fruit farms, its climate suddenly attracts moguls of the infant motion picture industry looking for good place to shoot few fair weather flickers. One of first to expand movie technique in wide open spaces of village called Hollywood is Al Christie, pioneer producer of motion picture comedies. By 1915, Hollywood is crowded with motion picture studios. And four years later, Douglas Fairbanks, D.W. Griffith, Mary Pickford, and Charlie Chaplin form United Artists Company. Early stars of New Company are Dorothy and Lillian Gish, here at work in one of early Hollywood studios. Leading star of her time, Miss Pickford continues in her role as America's sweetheart, typical American girl. Funniest man in motion pictures is Charlie Chaplin, at one time considered funniest man in the world. Early love stories involve the innocent maiden, enamored villain, brave hero, and happily ever after ending. Here's how they shot those early shooting movies. This has anything but the smoothness and glamour of talking westerns and scenery of present day outdoor epics, but this pioneer director says actors and actions are great. Again on Christie Lot, passage of time has meant rapid growth of movie industry and movie lots. Yes, that is Cecil B. DeMille, as young man and director. Hollywood's eternally pleasant weather has made possible such gigantic outdoor sets as this. No longer confined by studio walls, movie makers can now film scenes of impressive size and pageantry involving hundreds of people known as extras. This gives Hollywood unpleasant problem of overpopulation and underemployment. As friendly warning to thousands flocking to movie mecca, Doug Fairbanks asks that movie-struck men and women stay away from overcrowded land of make-believe. And thousands listen as Mary Pickford argues that though there's gold in them thar Hollywood hills, there's not enough for every actor and actress in America. Then in 1927, in this massive building, Al Jolson is starred in film called The Jazz Singer. Now, Hollywood and motion pictures are more thrilling than ever, bigger, more expensive than ever. For now, motion pictures can talk. Suddenly, Hollywood is land of the colossal and stupendous. Premiere of movie in 1930s has splendor and pageantry of national celebration. To Grauman's Chinese theater, flock Hollywood's royalty. Here's Hugh Herbert and Glenda Farrell. At the microphone is George Jessel. Movie bad man Humphrey Bogart is all dressed up. And here's John Barrymore, complete with profile. Here are Betty Davis and husband. And youthful Basil Rathbun shows up, as does beautiful Marie Wilson. Freddie Bartholomew is allowed to stay up late. Paul Muni appears as himself. And Errol Flynn appears with Lily Demita. Yes, this is Hollywood, Orange Grove of 1887, Los Angeles suburb in 1910. Today, the capital city of the motion picture world. In Sacramento, California, October 1928, world's top typists get go signs from state's Governor Young. And now is the time for all good typists to let those fingers fly. Both pros and amateurs type away for crown and national typing contests. Speedy and accurate, here's Irma Wright, best non-professional. And in men's division, Albert Tangora Wright is winner for the fourth time. (laughs) 
On train crossing Isthmus of Panama, here's United States Surgeon General William Crawford Gorgas. For battle against yellow fever, Gorgas was awarded Distinguished Service Medal in 1918, served as Chief of Sanitation Commission in Canal Zone, died in 1920 on Independence Day. Here's Lady Diana Duff Cooper, also known as Lady Diana Manners, famed actress of the 20s. Here she is in costume for role in Max Reinhardt's The Miracle. She was also starred in A.B.'s Irish Rose and screen version of A Glorious Adventure in 1922. Veteran of Spanish-American and First World Wars, here's Peter Bernard Kine, better known as Peter B. Kine, author of lengthy string of adventure stories. Beginning as clerk in General Merchandising Store, Kine won fame and fortune with magic of his pen. It's 1912, and near Saugatuck, Connecticut, New York, New Haven, and Hartford right-of-way is strewn with wreckage of wooden railway cars, crumpled and crushed in pile-up behind derailed locomotive. Alongside sheared-off telephone pole, survivors and rescuers search cars for casualties. Completion of grim job finds 50 persons injured, seven dead. With stunned spectators in the background, workmen begin task of clearing right of way for coming traffic. Fact that these films are old is evident in clothing worn by these women spectators. Cause of rail accident is unknown, but result is these historic scenes of death and disaster. It's April 1928, and Goliath, giant sea elephant, sings in his proportionately enormous bathtub. Swimmer by profession, Goliath has displayed startling ability as crooner, though his appearance and power of voice lend him much more promise for operatic roles. Goliath discovered his hidden talent when, in want of few additional fish for supper, he bellowed for more. The effect was like that of a barrel-chested, ditto-tummied basso profundo squawking his undying love for a dying heroine of some opera. How about an audition? Well, though Goliath didn't get anywhere as a singer, you know it wasn't for not tooting his own horn. Staten Island. It's July 23rd, 1928, and down the runway of Miller Field, Staten Island, New York, comes plane that has just circled globe in record time. Pilots are John Mears and CBD Collier. With mascot, they've completed round-the-world flight in 23 days, 15 hours, to lash almost five full days from then-existing record for round-the-world travel. Thousands cheer heroic Birdman, and following day, they're welcomed at City Hall, New York, by acting Mayor McKee, as Manhattan goes wild for daredevil flyers and their dog. String of pearls. There are 650,000 greenbacks in the little white globes that make up this string of pearls. That is, She's putting on a necklace worth $650,000. Large pearl in center of string is alone worth $140,001 bills. That's wearing expensive jewelry in a definitely expansive way. At O'Terry Racetrack about 1930, it's fluffy chiffon for the women, high hat formal for men. But this trader wears felt. Are long, and most popular patterns are large splashes of bright and vivid color. A long string of beads is part of every woman's costume. Yes, this is the way you looked just yesterday.
Washington, Baltimore Walk. It's April 17, 1926, and here's start of hike from nation's capital to Baltimore, over almost 50 miles of hard surface highway. It's test not only of endurance, but speed, and only hardiest hopers will make punishing journey from start to finish. Clockers and seconds accompany some contestants. Officials and judges are strung out along entire course. Of eight women contestants in walk, none finishes. This is Miss Elizabeth Miller. And this is Private Earl Olson of Camp Mead, Maryland, crossing finish line at City Hall, Baltimore, to cop top prize in contest. Winner Olson, who really had his feet on the ground. It's March 30th, 1928, and on banks of Thames, Oxford crew prepares for renewal of historic race against rowers from Cambridge. Rivals go through same routine in preamble to contest and hope to win for fifth successive year. Blazing to starting line, Cambridge crew digs in at crack of starting gun and pulls into early lead. From shore, Cambridge nearest camera holds lead over hard rowing eight from Oxford. It's all to tell who's all around for who here, as crews glide under famed Hammersmith Bridge with oarsmen in Cambridge colors still ahead. There's not too much water between hulls at this stage of race, but a little later on, Cambridge is far out in front and stretching distance between two hulls with every stroke. Finish line is not too far away and looks as if nothing will stop Cambridge now. And nothing does. Cambridge wins by 10 lengths, greatest margin of victory in 28 years. Oxford lads aren't poor losers. After long haul, they're just tired. 